everybody. So we're going to get started in just a second. I want to remind you all, welcome to uh, the Slow Food Lunch Break. We're going to be talking to Plez Montgomery IV today. It looks like he's uh, joining right now here. So let's go ahead and see who we can work. All right, here we go. Hey, there we go. Hey, Plez, how are you, man? It's, it's nice Doing to Doing all right, you. I'm going. Good, good, welcome. So, again, for the audience here, welcome everybody. And for those that uh, watch us on repeat later on Facebook or here on Instagram, uh, I'm joined today with Plez Montgomery IV of Oak Cliff Veggie Project uh, for our second slow food lunch break, where we uh, basically talk to the movers and shakers in the uh, food scene here in Dallas, people that are living up to the values that we have with slow food trying to push good, clean, and fair food for everybody. And, and uh, I think today you're the perfect person to talk to about fair food. And, um, you know, you've been, you've been working on this project, Oak Cliff Veggie Project. So I want to give yourself an opportunity to introduce what that is and yourself and, and when, when you got started with this project. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone doing out there? Uh, first, thank you, uh, Seth and uh, Slow Foods DFW, for having us uh, – for uh, inviting us into this conversation. Uh, I think this is very timely and uh, a needed type of conversation that is going to be, that needs to go on between uh, the different organizations and uh, in Dallas that are doing this kind of work. Um, so uh, I think this is really great what you're doing. So the Oakland Veggie Project started as a, um, uh, a very small food uh, distribution, actually um, by my mother. I am the co-founder uh, of it. Uh, Betty Montgomery, my mother, um, was um, uh, inspired or, or moved to uh, to start a food uh, a food distribution uh, to provide uh, better access to uh, fresh produce uh, within a community that uh, falls under the designation of a food desert um, in the southern uh, southern district of Dallas. And um, uh, so from there it has grown. That was probably about six years ago or so. And from there, it has grown into the nonprofit that everyone knows today as the uh, the Oak Cliff Veggie Project. Uh, maybe about three, three or four years, and about 2018 uh, is when I kind of got involved with it after volunteering, uh, uh, starting my journey in urban agriculture by volunteering with Big Tech's Urban Farms at Fair Park. Um, the uh, Dallas Mayor Stock Council and Big Tech's Urban Farms was looking for a project in the uh, District 3 in the Southern Sector to support with the resources to get a, a, a community garden started. And I kind of happened to be in the right place at the right, right time. Um, so we got our first community garden started uh, at um, in Singing Hills at 5915 Singing Hill Drive, where you can find us on the third Saturday of every month uh, doing food distribution. So that, um, that kind of led us into what the Veggie Project is all about, where we are, um, uh, our three tenants are uh, education, cultivation, and preparation. So our mission is to cultivate a healthier, stronger, more self-reliant uh, community uh, by means of reintroducing the practice of cooperative community uh, cultivation. Um, this, uh, in, in the days of yesteryear, the, the community garden uh, was, um, was a, um, it, it was part of, it was integral part of the community of any community, any neighborhood, everyone had uh, fam different families had community had gardens in their yards. Everyone was growing a little bit of their own food. People were trading that food within those communities, uh, or there was just a main a main communal gardening uh, farming space uh, that uh, anyone could uh, walk to or catch a quick ride to. Uh, and that's something that has have we have lost uh, throughout the years with uh, quote unquote modernization. Uh, and uh, it's, it's something we'd like to bring back into. Uh, uh, re again uh, reintroduced to communities as something that can help heal uh, and build uh, healthier, stronger, more self reliant communities. Well, it sounds like you're well on your way to to making that happen already, at least in where you are. And you know, I wonder with what's going on in the world right now, you've probably noticed how everybody's suddenly into gardening again. Got people planting victory gardens, and so this is a really timely kind of subject. And it seems like, you know, everywhere I turn, everybody's like, hey, we're going to get plant starts. And oh, can you introduce me to some farmers? And so we figured we'd bring somebody on who knows a lot more about that. And it's, you know, actually out there trying to start these gardens. And um, you know, I guess the first question I have for you is, you know, what have been the big challenges so far? You know, one of the things that I that I've seen, I guess, you know, living in Dallas in this area for a long time is we actually have a lot of food deserts. I mean, we have a lot of grocery stores. I think we have more 
like more grocery stores than anywhere else in the country by some measures, but it doesn't seem like any of them are in the South sector. And, you know, I wonder with all the incentives that are getting thrown around by the government, is this just people just don't particularly want to do this or, you know, what, what has your, been your experience with this, you know, cause you're, you're kind of on the ground. So the, um, the first thing that we, that I think that we need to look at is the fact that in, uh, prior to the the onset of the pandemic um with the food system working at top at high capacity the food system as we know it i mean the industrial food system in america where food is grown most of the food is grown in in certain parts of the country and then shipped uh stored and packed and then shipped and it's grown so that it can make those trips across the country right those we're seeing those systems fail because even at their best those systems operate with a 40 percent food loss average Wow. Uh, anywhere between some place that happens at the point of uh, somewhere between the point of harvest and, and uh, consumption. So it has to do with um, uh, it has a lot to do with how we have as a society have uh, been mismanaging our uh, our industrial food, um, uh, our industrial food landscape, so to speak. So uh, we're all we're all very much responsible. Um, the the challenge in building from the ground up a localized, uh, a, a local, a local focus and base of, uh, of an urban agricultural infrastructure, which is what is, what is needed to combat that situation that everyone is very, very much reliant and dependent on this big giant food system. Uh, it, the, the inadequacies uh, and inequities in it have been revealed uh, in a very loud way uh, over the past few months, right? So, the the solution the, the the main solution one of the main solutions to that is a low a very strong local resilient agricultural food system. Now, the challenge to that is uh, the the community buy-in uh, and the value that food has. So so in these food deserts there are grocery stores right, but the, the actual definition of food desert is lack of access to fresh produce where there's a certain right. distance between the the individuals. That uh, that need that fresh produce and and how far they would have to travel uh, to get to it. So the reason why we have so much of that in uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area is because the the even the stores that are in located in these uh, in these quote unquote food deserts are um, uh, they don't have fresh produce. They may have they may have produce, but a lot of the the the, the brands that are located there, these cost saver plus these um, uh, those types of stores, those are secondhand. Uh, stores when it comes to produce. So as produce is grown on a national level, there are different grades of it. So when it is sold through the through the wholesaling system, you get there's top grade that is sold for produce that is going to go to a grocery store that you as an end user, you're going to see what that produce looks like. So they want it to look a certain way and make sure that you think right. that, that you feel like if it doesn't look this way, then I can't buy it. Meanwhile, the place where you get your juice, where you might buy your cold pressed juice from, or you might buy your sandwich from, or your ready your your grab and go salad from, they don't they are not so enthralled with buying produce that looks right a certain yeah. way because they're going to chop it up and you never see the whole fruit. So that that um, that sectioning uh, of um, of the way the produce is moved, grown and moved through the system has a, a lot to do with it. So. Uh, there's produce that goes to these kind of top shelf uh, 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 distribution hubs, the the food stores, the Whole Foods, that kind of thing. They um, uh, and I'm not I'm not trying to rag on anybody's program. No, for sure. <laughs> but, uh, so it, let's say they they might get the first choice of the best looking, closest produce to them. They are able to sell it, and some of what they don't able to sell, it then moves down through the system into uh, is, is bought off the, the is bought off and then bought off and sold at, at different, and then moved down to this. The last stop is these cost saver pluses and these these uh, these food stores that are in the uh, quote unquote food deserts, right? So even though there's produce getting there, it's not, it may not be fresh produce. It may not be quality. It may not be to the quality right. that it at that time. As we all know, as soon as things are harvested, they start, it's like a car coming off the lot. You start losing the value in that. And that's the nutritional value. That's the flavor content, which is what we all look for, uh, what we all need out of food. Like, yes, we do. We enjoy eating because it tastes good. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, it's about nutrition. Right. So, right. There are so many things that uh, the, the, the value in in our food system is what is what's missing and why what the main challenge is building these local resilient food systems that 
the the nutritional value that you are looking for as a consumer uh you have to understand what it takes what it go, what goes into that there is the the farmer who is running this big uh one acre half acre 10 acre 30 acre 100 acre farm the amount of work it actually takes to go into that the people that they have to pay the packaging that has to go into the 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 regulations and systems that are uh, are are that the federal government has the USDA like there are uh, there are permits and things that have to be that have to be paid for. And then if we're talking about the national system uh, or some kind of national trucking system, like you have to move the food from one place to another, right. that it costs, that it costs. So uh, a lot of our communities, unfortunately, we do not, um, the value, the understanding of the value of food is not there. And that doesn't mean that food should be super expensive, but the compensations need to be understood and need to be managed uh, in a much better way than what has been happening. Uh, it takes a lot to produce the amount of food that go that we see moving throughout the country, whether it be from local farmers or from a farmer that's a thousand miles away from you. Uh, and um, our our communities do not have just we the the understanding is not uh, is not there. It's not given. So you know when we talk about the value of food, I think anybody that's ever watched a farmer work, you know, for a day or participated in that themselves understands, you know, the next time they go to the grocery store and they see the tomato and it's like a quarter, they're like, wow, <laughs> you know, how much of that really moves all the way back up? And right. we're talking about, you know, the, the way that the way that food moves into these communities. So, you know, we've got a, we've got a population um, of people in general, really, in this country that don't value produce probably as highly as we should, and we're not really willing to spend higher prices. We're always looking for lower prices most of the time. And then that's coupled with these food deserts where they, they may have produce, but it's not like high quality produce necessarily, or maybe they don't have um, consistency, or maybe it's just not as available because of transportation issues, um, whether that's from the people or from distribution, right? What is your vision to beginning to change this? Does, is, I assume it, it has something to do with gardens. Yeah, it does. The uh, the the local com the community garden uh, aspect of our program, uh, which is the uh, cultivate the community initiative, uh, is to uh, to help uh, establish as many community gardens as possible. Uh, but community garden is a terminology that um, that kind of has this idea of um, uh, what's the term like. Uh, as hobby at best, right? And when you're producing food, it is very easy actually to produce more food than you as an individual can consume. The issue is the same issue that happens uh, in the in the industrialized system uh, of farming, right? So uh, it's uh, storage, it's uh, transportation, mm -hmm. and doing that in a way that is going to protect people and keep everybody safe. And I don't mean just from a pandemic, but from the the natural foodborne diseases that come if you leave food sitting out for too long and it's not refrigerated properly and those types of things. So that's where we have uh, those are the missing components within a lo what a local the solutions that a localized food system could provide. Uh, the reason why we had uh, the the reason why there was these stories about the uh, the food being plowed under at the farms and and why this uh, this whole the the farm to to family program was was initiated uh, by the federal government to to pay for these things, uh, and it's because it's twofold. It's because the the farmers the the market streams that that a lot of the farms were uh, were dependent on dried up. I.e. your uh, your 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 tourism industry, your entertainment industry, those type, those uh, the the school systems, those 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 market systems dried up, right? So then now the farmer can't pay the farmhand, so now there's no hands to even pull the food out of uh, the ground in the first place and get it packaged up and sent. And then there's the the actual transportation and storage where we have our uh, the the distribution networks, the wholesalers, they only have so much refrigeration space at their warehouses wherever they be located. Um, those are those are bottlenecks within the system. Now a lot of those bottlenecks are are purposely placed there because just like any other commodity, uh, like diamonds, for example, diamonds are actually rare. The, they right. are a certain number of them that are kept off of the market in order to to provide it, to, to put them at a certain value level uh, at the when they are actually purchased. And food is is done is uh, kept and moved uh, in the same in the same way, uh, just like a lot of other a lot of other uh, products. So uh, it's a matter of, of truly analyzing the systems that we have. Um, in order to find out where the inequities lie and the inconsistencies lie, 
and uh, and tackling those uh, in a very collective and meaningful way to provide the most value for both the people who are growing the food and for the people who are uh, who are using and, and eating the food at the end of the day. Uh, that right. that should be the yeah. goal. Like agriculture is a is a is a linchpin of human civilization. We didn't have. Uh, economics and and military and and politics until we we had a, a stable agricultural system so that we could feed ourselves and each other and we've gotten so far away from that uh, as as in several other areas as well like uh, teachers aren't valued the way that they should be the doc the the farmers are not valued the way that they should be um, uh, healthcare providers are not valued the way that they should be uh, and so these are some of the things that we need to look around uh, on a re- back, back to on a local level. Um, we all need to take a little more time. Uh, I think we've seen this boom in uh, what is happening. Everybody interested in gardening. It's not something that people have not been interested in. Everybody's been interested in it. It takes time to do it, though. And you have to have those local sources. Like, everybody has access to the Internet. You can look up online and see some videos. But it speaks uh, very – there's something to be said about the the in-person learning aspect of the yeah. process to have someone local that you can go to, that you can trust, that you can ask, okay, find out where these local farms are and know those farmers and you know their practices. That way you don't have to trust advertising, which as I mean, anybody that studied it, I studied advertising. That was my actual field of study at college was marketing. Oh, really? And the literally, it's literally, you, you literally learn how to brainwash people, to put a message that's going to pull at their, their emotions, at their fears, at their, their, their joys, like what have you. So the only way to combat that is to know what is actually happening uh, and know who your farmers are and shop uh, and purchase and support as uh, local systems as possible. And then we need our our local governance structures to help uh, put money into programs that will allow uh, organizations like uh, Slow Foods DFW, uh, Oakland uh, Oakland Veggie Project, um, Big Tech's Urban Farms, Restorative Farms. Uh, will give us the means uh, and the connections within the the, the local system to, to build those urban, uh, those local infrastructures so that we, if, if we are growing this food, if the community is participating in growing that food, that that food can be properly stored and then disseminated into those communities that in a way that provides value on all areas of the chain. And then there's also the side of the waste side of it, where we have Harvest Project Food Rescue here in Dallas uh, that has been working for years behind the scenes, uh, reducing the the that food waste and helping to educate people that the food doesn't have to look perfect. Like there are, but again, this requires educational a platform to educate our community on that to say, hey, just because it doesn't look the way it does in the store does not mean it's it's not still edible. Yeah, maybe it might not be edible, but you not you need to be educated and understanding. Uh, we need to educate our community and work together so that we all have a better understanding of what. Uh, edible food actually looks like. Yeah, for sure. So, so I'm seeing a, a couple of things here. One is sort of the individual needing to kind of pay attention to where the food's coming from, but also understand that, you know, there's, there's more food that's edible than maybe they think. And then, you know, kind of bringing that out to the community level, we're talking about people coming together in a way to sort of create these, this like real local agriculture. Uh, and, but I want to talk to you about the government part of this, because you know, you see a little bit of, of this, I think, happening. There's there's a lot of excitement around farmers markets, for instance, in our area. We have some really, really good ones, some kind of okay ones as well. And, you know, people people seem to show up there. But I'm wondering from a from sort of a I guess upper level community and like looking at um looking at the government, you know, what would be a good system in order to actually start this? Because I think that, you know, like we we're talking about kind of earlier people are excited about these things now, you know, and it seems like there's a little bit of tension now that people would actually be willing to make some of these changes. Maybe if we knew what to change. So the best thing that the government can do is we need them to ease up on the restrictions. I mean, there are the, we need, we need the community uh, members, all the, any, any community based food organizations, um, we need to be putting more pressure on our local governments uh, in order to allow for more markets. Like there's only a certain window of the year, a certain number of weekends out of the year that a, that a farmer's market can operate uh, in the Dallas area. There's only a certain amount of hours per day that you are allowed to operate. And you have to be at certain distances from other 
uh, farmers markets, uh, specifically like the downtown uh, uh, farmers market uh, uh, that we've seen a, I mean, uh, unfortunately, we've seen a decline of the number of farmers that actually attend who are growing uh, their, who are growing their own produce. Um, uh, even uh, the ability for a community organization to set up a market uh, in a, uh, at, at a, whether it's a vacant lot whether it's in front of uh, other, it's it's on a parking lot with other businesses, whether it's on a church lot, the steps that we have to go through, like those need to be uh, to be reevaluated and uh, really given a little more leeway so that when you have, if, with, if the Dallas city uh, government is looking at this newfound interest in, uh, in community garden and participating in local food systems, that seeing how high that it is here in Dallas and how many people actually want this, that the, the literally what's it, what the problem is the, the the legal situations that are that are in place that allow for the trade of uh, of local food uh, whether it's somebody that's growing it in their backyard or somebody that has right. uh, two acres behind their home or transforms their their empty lot that they were going to put a business on and now they're growing food there until they can afford to put their business up that we that there are outlets uh, more than just the uh, the the one main hub in uh, in downtown, and uh, and unfortunately, there's there's nothing else like that on the in the southern sector of Dallas in the areas where it is yeah. actually most needed. And in those areas, actually, the hardest they make it the hardest to they make it the hardest to set up in those areas, and and just to do that business of bringing people together to interact with each other. And and I know we have to take all these precautions now, but before this was ever an issue, like it was incredi it's incredibly hard to set up a market that allows for, uh, especially these pop populations that are dependent on uh, on using, uh, let's say they're they're on the the government support programs, the WIC, the Women, Infant, and Children program, or they have SNAP benefits. Like setting up a uh, the there are barriers to setting up these programs that the the government systems. Have not made easier, nor have a lot of the the uh, the organizations that have uh, been around in this town for uh, for a for a while have they have not made it easy for people to get access to, or sit not have not been set even trying to set up at times that are make it convenient. Uh, the the issue about about low priced food and mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing is this idea of convenience, convenience, convenience. Like that's what that's what we needed to be and. That's not how that's not how food actually works. Uh, <laughs> no, not convenient, not convenient to, at all. <laughs> it, exactly. So it's, it's a it's an understanding that we that we kind of have to 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 move uh, do the net the, like the title of of slow foods DFW like we have to this is something where we really need to slow down uh, our um, uh, the way with that we're making moves and um, and not to have it be this this very fast introduction like it's not like going through a drive through. To get some food right. that somebody else has already prepared for you. That's not the, the, the point of this. Like we want more families together, uh, breaking bread together and cooking meals together and passing down these traditions and these recipes uh, from years uh, in their family. And they need fresh, healthy produce to do that. And I mean, it, it uh, even, even going even a step further is the health of the community. Like that's the the first word in our in our mission is to build a healthier community. Yeah. And so many of these things that could be that we could be these there's local these local food programs can be partnering with the local health care uh, systems in order to provide that different level of health care that uh, that puts the person that needs the health care more in charge of their uh, or of their their of their own health rather than being told oh, this, is what you need yeah. to do, this is the pill that you need to take or now you're just you're you're done like this is going to be your situation for the rest of your for the rest of your days and that is that has been proven by so many that it's just the farthest thing from the truth like changes to diet and lifestyle they they take time they take a slowing down and a uh, and a working together of these systems whether it's a it be a mom and pop uh, maybe whether it be a mom and pop food, uh, uh, pop up food store that's run by a local teacher that this is her her quote unquote side business, uh, but that she she provides the they they provide this uh, they provide healthy food options for folks, uh, or whether it be the the cafeteria in the school or in the hospital for that matter. Um, yeah, you have to be working more together, and there there's actually federal dollars that do this. It's but if the city is not pushing its businesses to participate mm -hmm. in that, like. There's the, and then on the food waste side, there's programs with the city of Dallas that they are supposed to be working with businesses to collect the uh, things that can go into compost or be taken to farms to feed to animals. Right. But this stuff ends up getting just thrown away because there's no pressure being put on anybody 
uh, on on the uh, on the businesses. There's no city mandates. There's no ordinances, and the ones that are out there are so outdated, and nobody we're not putting pressure enough on them to review these things and to change these ordinances. So it's easier for us to all work together. Yeah, well, you know, I think we're getting a really good list of things to start writing our, our council people about here. And yeah, I hope everybody that's on and listening is writing these things down and go we're to gonna, We're going to write them down and send them out to everybody that's on our email list, actually, because this, this is exactly the right stuff to be doing right now. And, you know, I want to hit on a couple of these points. You know, we talked about this idea where we don't have the year round availability of, of this produce, you know, and somebody in the comments mentioned that it would, you know, if we were able to sell this produce more easily then more farmers would be growing it, uh, which makes perfect sense, of course, you know, and so I think the idea of an urban farm stand and the idea of having a year round farmers market that's really full of farmers and perhaps a, a more, um, you know, a system, maybe a wheel and spoke kind of situation where you've got more distribution hubs so that we can increase that access or things that you know, Dallas should really be trying to lead the charge in. And, and I think that if we did start interacting with our community managers a little bit more and, and our city leaders, I think that these are things that we could accomplish. You know, I, I think that we've got a couple fairly progressive folks on, on city council now that would be pretty interested in seeing these changes. And so that's something that definitely we're going to we're going to push for as a community here with Slow Food. And uh, we'll start we'll start beating their doors down. You know, uh, before we run out of time here, Plez, I, I want to ask you about how people can get involved. You know, we've got some questions from the audience that came up when we posted this. And, you know, people are really specifically interested in how they can support you and what you're doing, because what you're doing is amazing. But I think people are also really interested in how they can, like, personally get involved with what you're doing. And if there's volunteer opportunities and you know, how folks can get involved with that starting now. Uh, absolutely. So we run um we actually currently operate about four community gardens uh in the southern sector we have a, a few other new locations that are going to be coming online over the course of this year uh, the first way to get involved is to start growing on your own uh, the easiest way to do that is to regrow um, start by regrowing your food scraps if you are going to the store and you are buying whatever produce you are buying if you get peppers if you get cucumbers if you get if, if you get apples like Whatever you have, if it has seeds in it, take off some of those, take some of those seeds and, and try and, and plant them. Look up, look you up some videos, contact us. Uh, I know there's a, a great local, a few great local farmers uh, at uh, Big Tech Urban Farms, Drew Dimler and Baron Horton down there. Uh, there's uh, Ramblin Farms. Uh, uh, my personal favorite farmer is Darcia Houston uh, that will, that can help create a, a space for you, no matter how much space you actually have to work with. Uh, we'll teach you about how to regrow from uh, your food scraps. Uh, a lot of the your your leafy greens, your celery, your your lettuces, your onions, those are things that can be regrown. So that's a, a great way to really start is to try growing some of your own food. And this lends to the education about the process of growing food for the individual. So you right. understand what it truly uh, really takes. Um, please reach out to us on uh, on our Facebook page. Um, we're still working on getting our full um, uh, website up and running. Um, but right now we have the Facebook page and the, the Instagram page here. Uh, mm -hmm. Every weekend we are rotating between our local community garden spaces uh, uh, where you can you can come out on that weekend and help us with our food distribution. The veggie store was our very first project, and that's where we distribute food for free. We also pass out recipe information, local health resources, and other food resources. Uh, there's a great amount of, uh, of uh, food banks in the, the southern sector that can help out with that. Uh, and then also uh, some uh, marketplace. There's uh, uh, the holistic uh, holistic uh, community market that sets up in various locations. You can find them on Instagram as well. Um, uh, uh, support the Harvest Project. If you want to support us, really just you can contact me at uh, plesmm4 at gmail.com. You can message us, please, on the Facebook page, uh, and we can give you the rundown of where our gardens are located at. Um, and how often we need to be uh, tending to those gardens. Um, the other way to get involved is to find out who, uh, if you follow our page and several of the other pages, they will let you know where there are local um, local farming operations going on, uh, where you can purchase you can purchase seedlings from them uh, to get started uh, with restorative farms, uh, veggie project. We sell seedlings. We have a new project going on where you can purchase a ready made. Uh, grow box just like much like restorative farms is doing where it'll be a, a, a raised bed box that will be complete with soil 
and some seedlings to help get you started if you have that space. Uh, that is a is based on a you make a donation to us, we come out and set you up and provide, and then that oh, wow. really helps go into to support the the ongoing operation of our community gardens and our food distribution project. Uh, if you are a part of a um, if you have a a kids group or a youth group, uh, and uh, we have uh, as we are slowly starting to move out of uh, less social distancing uh, and and being able to interact more with each other. Please contact us. We have these garden spaces set up. We want to begin to to teach uh, to teach our youth uh, and and um, um, about these growing practices and get them out into the garden, get their hands into the garden, so they understand that you no, know, the green beans do not come out of a can in the store. They come out of the ground somewhere that somebody put their love and their effort and their time into. Uh, and then also uh, preparation. We're going to be doing a lot more uh, educational classes around how to prepare. Uh, these foods uh, so that when you do get them, you know what to do with them and you can, uh, it allows you to live a, a much more healthy lifestyle on your terms. Uh, and please support local, support local, support local folks. Uh, and then push your, push your businesses, uh, find out if the, if the, the, the places that you're going to buy your food from or buy your juice from, push them to support local. They can purchase from, uh, they can purchase food from a community garden, make a donation that, and then that, that goes into uh, into their business, and then that supports that that local that local program. Um, it's just about us working together uh, to make sure that the the money stays as as local as possible, and that uh, the the farmer is being paid paid. That's that's who you're supporting. If you support a local farm, you can know that you are supporting someone from your community who has taken the time uh, to 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 grow that. There's a Dallas half acre farm uh, grows a really grows really great lettuces. Uh, that's another local farmer, uh, Trisha Ray, uh, with Yummy's Edible Plants. Uh, she has uh, uh, the best uh, uh, purple whole peas uh, in the city. Uh, if I if I can be a little, uh, if I can shoot her a plug real quick, uh, she has farm fresh eggs, different animals. If you will, if you want to get started, uh, there's uh, Dallas Urban Farms. Uh, they do uh, rabbits, and they're 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 growing um, the they're growing a lot of good things that that you can uh, that you can support. So. Uh, Follow our pages, follow those pages, uh, support uh, those people, and also support the local food businesses. They are going to be, we are we are building a network of local small uh, family food businesses that we are going to start supporting. They will start supporting the, the local farmers. So you will know that you are supporting a, a local business on all fronts, that their, their, their food supply is coming from a local business and, and they're feeding their families, they're, they're feeding the, the city locally here. So we wanna keep the money moving as much as possible within, within the, the realms of, of, of local. And local can mean down the street, it can mean 150 miles away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but the, the idea is knowing who your, your farmer is. Like ask, start putting that pressure on, uh, be a more informed consumer. Ask where, hey, where do you get your eggs from? Where are you getting this from? Where are you getting that from? Do you support these local businesses? Uh, just just that question is going to move every help to move everybody in the right direction of how uh, to build a more resilient local uh, local food system that wouldn't have these issues the same wouldn't be wouldn't fall so heavily victim to uh, when situations like this happen and if the entire system crumbles we know that we all have each other's backs and that that we're working uh, that we are working towards those goals. Well, I, I got to say, Plez, you, you're doing good work and uh, you are a wealth of information. So mm -hmm. we need to plan on doing another something like this again, a little bit longer, some more people and, and talking some, maybe when we can all meet in public, uh, because I really want to pick your brain about more of these things. Right on. Uh, if we have any more time, was there anybody, did anybody in the comments, I was trying to follow the comments, did anybody down there have any questions they wanted to uh, get with real quick? See here. Well, while we while we look through there, I'm I'm looking through. Um, I did want to mention that you know the big takeaways that that I've got from this today are that you know we need to be putting pen to paper and asking for these things that we want in the world, right? I mean, actually, our you know the city managers are actually pretty pretty accessible here in our city. You know, most of them are face on Facebook. You can literally just tag them in posts. But mm -hmm. what I've noticed is a lot of people don't even know who, uh, you know, is running their district. And so I think it's a good idea for everybody to research that, understand where you live, understand your community, figure out the name of your city council person and start blowing them up on Facebook, you know, tag them and everything. And you need to make sure that, you know, you're engaged in the community and asking for the things that you want. And I think the other one was that you need to get your hands in the dirt. You know, I think it's super, super important. Uh, we do have a question here about local farms. If you go to our website, slowfooddfw.org, there's a 
massive list of local farms. You can check that out. Um, you know, of course, look at what Oak Cliff Veggie Projects put together as well. Uh, we're going to be sending out emails as well. So make sure you sign up for that email list and, uh, and, and we'll let you know as more of these projects and stuff come online and you'll cool. be able to, uh, to so reach out and support the people that are close to you. Are you still there? Oh, it looks like he's, uh, he's reconnecting here. Anyway, I'm just going to keep talking. So um, anyway, yeah, so if we can, you know, we're going to put together a list of things that, uh, that we rounded up from this conversation and we're gonna we're gonna send that out if you're on our email list. If you're not yet, get on there, slowfooddfw.org. Make sure you're following us here on Instagram. Check us out on Facebook as well. You can find us really easily. Oh, there you are again, Plus, Sorry, you just dropped out for a second there. I just keep talking, so it's all good. And right uh, we were just talking about local farms. I just mentioned that we've got a big list of them here on our website. And do you guys have a, a coordinated list anywhere yet that you can point people to? Uh, we're still uh, we're still working on it. Um, we are uh, we are also very much uh, more focused on the uh, the local farmers uh, of color that are have, are traditionally and the communities that are traditionally uh, underserved uh, in this um, in this regard. So that's what we're going to be focusing our our efforts on. Uh, there is a lot of good work being done. There's a profound uh, profound foods and profound market farms that, that they are they they kind of serve us to further. North Dallas area, and there's nothing, um, uh, there's nothing kind of, uh, no collection really like that of, uh, of folks working together uh, in the southern sector. Um, so that's where our our focus is in, in these communities of color that really that really need the help. That this is where we live at. Uh, that have been traditionally underserved. Again, they end up getting the the seconds and the last and the 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 yeah. side. Unfortunately, I saw some just something this morning where it was uh, food that was supposed to be going to a wig market was mm -hmm. just. It was just terrible looking, and it's like these are the these are the people who are the most vulnerable, who actually need the healthier food uh, uh, for their. I mean, we're talking women, infants, and children. Like that is literally the acronym for that uh, for that. Yeah. Uh, that and then the, the southern sector stations for those are getting the, getting this this hand me down uh, food that that should have uh, was is way past its prime. And again, there's food that can get past its its quote unquote prime of the way it looks uh, and still still be edible, but. Uh, if the nutrition has been, if it's been so long that the food has been out there and the nutritional value is gone, then uh, they might as well be eating uh, hot chips and, and candy bars. You know, it's yeah. a, so yeah. it's a matter of, of respect for for everyone, um, especially when it's mostly on on big farms. Like it's mostly uh, people of color who are working those farms. These are the the these, this is our these are the people that we have to we have to honor these people that go out and do the hard jobs that uh, that most folks would not. Uh, would not want to get up and do or are just unable to to get up and do and uh the the communities who have been underserved need to to be more readily served and uh and thought about uh and and have more say so in what happens uh in their community uh unfortunately too many of our organizations um uh operate in a, in a way of of coming into these communities and saying that this is what they need to do without actually uh, gaining the uh, without going in to get the trust and working through, and working with uh, the families that, and the, the and the people that live there, uh, and it is a very unfortunate situation, but one that is a a, a, a remnant um, symptom of the history of uh, of how this this country has done done business uh, that uh, we are working to get past, um, and we will get past it. <laughs> By, by any means necessary. So we're going to make the wow. changes. That, that I agree. <laughs> it's uh, time we changed it. You know, we need fair food for everybody. And uh, I think that's why, you know, I think that's why slow food exists really is this idea that it's not good enough just for, for me or for you to have access to great food. Everybody needs access to great food. Otherwise, we're not a good community, you know, and we have to change it. And uh, like we said today, you know, it starts with getting your hands in the dirt. It starts with supporting local and, you know, hyper local if you can. But really, it's time that we raised our voices and started asking for what we want. It's, it's not enough just to sit around and think about it, you know, and talk about it amongst ourselves. We need to get out there and start pushing for it, demanding it, making these changes. And, um, you know, if the government won't do it for us, then I think we need to start running for office. I think you'd be a you'd be a great candidate, Pledge. You should think about it, man. Nah, nah, I ain't running for no office. Like I'm the 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 answer to that is the government can't the 
the government, I just, the government never wanted to do it. They they have the means of doing it the right way. We just saw with the pandemic that that all of a sudden there's billions of dollars to go around there's when so much every, any other time that that the people would raise their voice and say, "Hey, how come there's no funding for this? How come there's no funding for that?" And it's like, "Oh, we can't do that. It's not. It's going to cost us too much." And now all of a sudden there's money to make it happen. Uh, I'm 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 done. Like I'm not waiting. We uh, we're we're past the point of of asking for permission. And waiting for somebody else to decide how something should be done and whether it it's, it should be done. Like we know what the right things are to be done, and uh, that's what this whole that's what the movement and uh, the the message of the Veggie Project and all of our community partners that have been doing this uh, for years without uh, without any major funding uh, or without any budgets. Like we can we can make it happen. Or we have to be be able to participate in the systems and the systems as they had before uh, don't have us participating as anything but consumers at the end of the the road. Yeah. Uh, so to speak, and we have to take a, a more we have to take a a, a more participatory stance uh, in our health um, and our uh, our communal strength and our well being, and uh, that's that's how we're that's how we're going to get it done. And uh, we can ask for uh, we can ask for forgiveness on the flip side if somebody doesn't like it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it throws I a monkey it. wrench in throws a monkey wrench in their system. So be it. Like everybody, yeah. everybody eats, uh, and everybody will eat as far as uh, as far as the Oakley Veggie Project is concerned. Um, even if we have to to take a to go put a, a grow box in everybody's backyard. I love it. That that's what we need. Plus, thank you so much for the work that you're doing with the Oakley Veggie Project. Everybody, make sure you're following him, checking it out. Go volunteer. Check out what they've got going on, and um, we'll have to do this again sometime soon, man. This has been really amazing. You're you're so full of. Uh, so full of knowledge. Thank you so much for helping us. Absolutely, folks. There's a there's a donate button on the Facebook page. Uh, if you're not comfortable with donating through Facebook, please contact us directly. We'll set up another means for you to make a financial donation if that's what you have. Uh, we are looking to uh, immediately, like, if there's anybody out there, you know, somebody that can uh, help with uh, with insulation for a cold storage unit. That is what we are are building. We were actually awarded uh, some uh, some funding from the national body of the Slow Foods Movement. Uh, which we thank you, thank you, thank you so much uh, for that. It's one of the first kind of grants that we've actually ever received oh, so as awesome. a nonprofit, uh, and we're going to be using that to uh, to create a, a, a kind of a cold storage uh, uh, system to 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 be as a beginning of this uh, building of infrastructure. And uh, any of our community partners that we are working with will will be able to have access to that if they are growing food, so that we can uh, we can properly store. And make sure that we are managing the the health of the produce from uh, from its in, from seed to harvest to uh, to distribution uh, on a on a local level. Um, so if anybody out there knows somebody that doesn't that does uh, that kind of insulation uh, for cold storage to spray on the insulation, is somebody. Like, please like we need somebody to kind of donate the to if they could donate the time uh, or the and the equipment to to make that happen. Uh, we we're, we're getting started with that. So please contact me in that regard. Uh, that's one of the key components to a resilient local uh, ag uh, infrastructure is having that uh, that cold storage uh, set up uh, to uh, to facilitate distribution uh, and the safety of the food. Well, it couldn't be for a better cause. And um, thank you so much again, Plez. And somebody asked about political strategy. Just reach out to me. I'm at Seth Brammer. I'd love to talk politics all day long. Whoever's in the comments, ask that question. And uh, We'll I, I do not here. like to talk politics. I like to talk community <laughs> action. Like, if you want to get into the, if you want to get into let's the ground, <laughs> right? Let's go get some pro, get some work done. Then you, then you call me, and we can talk about that. All right, that sounds good, Plez. Well, we'll we'll catch up again soon, my friend, and be safe out there. And and again, thank you so much. And we'll see everybody here next week uh, for another lunch break. Uh, all right, stay safe with us, Seth. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. We love you yeah. all. All right.